Good evening. Welcome to Rhodes College. My name is Jonathan Judakin. I'm the Spence L. Wilson Chair in the Humanities and the coordinator of the Communities and Conversation events here at Rhodes. Um, tonight's event embodies what Communities and Conversation is really all about, since what we are going to dialogue about tonight did not begin this evening, and it will not end tonight. Tonight is part of a series of programs that all fall under the beautiful umbrella of Memphis Reads. Created by Rhodes alum, Karen Golightly, now professor of English and director of the Fresh Reads program at Christian Brothers University. Memphis Reads is about building community one book at a time. Can we please give Karen Golightly a round of applause for all the heavy lifting she's done to make all of this possible. This is gonna be an annual and ongoing conversation that we really wanna see grow and build and that I hope Rhodes will be a, a part of moving into the future. She really is an amazing model to all Rhodes students and indeed to all of us. Now you know that the book that we read this year was written by Dave Eggers and titled, What is the What? The Autobiography of Valentino Acek Deng. For me at least, that is a title of heartbreaking genius. And I'm looking forward to understanding it in a deeper way over the next two days. Before we dig into this, there are a whole slew of, of sponsors and community partners that I, that I would like to thank um, that are all a part of Memphis Reads, but I know that if I mentioned all of them, I would try your patience. Um, They're all listed on the poster for tonight's event, and we are grateful to all of them for their support. But I do want to say a big thank you to the Memphis Public Library. If you are a Rhodes student and you have not visited the Ben Hooks Library right down the street from here, shame on you. Go. Go soon. It is a wonderful place to work and to do your research. I do need to thank, however, the main sponsors for tonight's event um, here at Rhodes College, in particular, the Booth Cody Dorch Quinn Endowment for the Humanities. They have not only made tonight possible, but um, their very generous gift is going to make it possible for us to engage in a series of events uh, annually. Tonight was also made possible with funding from Dean Moreland in Academic Affairs, and all of the CIC series would not be possible without the support of Rhodes Lecture Board. The hard labor, though, uh, for tonight uh, the heavy lifting, the work that's done on a daily basis to make this all possible is done by Brianna Summers, Bonnie Whitehouse, and Jackie Baker. Now, hundreds upon hundreds of students and scores and scores of others across Memphis have read What is the What? And prior to this evening, we've gathered together in groups to understand the history behind the text, and the literary approach to telling the story. We've watched films about the Lost Boy experience, like The Good Lie. And we've reflected on how this one story encapsulates the stories of millions whose tales have not been told or heard. But in the next two days, we get to hear from the protagonists, live and direct and in dialogue with them in person. And for me, that is really exciting. Here's the order of ceremonies. After some brief opening comments, about 10 to 15 minutes by Valentino Acek Deng, we're gonna start with questions uh, from two Rhodes students in order here. Uh, Maddie Kunzley and George Galekos, and from a CBU student, Tristan Barton. They will be followed by questions 
from some of our esteemed faculty, Shadrach and Sango, who is chair of international studies and just edited a book on ethnic violence in Africa, Baron Boyd, a Rhodes alum, professor in international studies. Valentino said that he is considered the elder here in the United States, in part because um, he uh, visited Sudan several times with a former student of his who was another one of the Lost Boys. And then at the end of our panel up here, Marshall Boswell, who chairs the English department and who is an expert on contemporary American literature. And then we will turn the questions over to you. I want to let students know that um, if you're brave enough to put your hand in the air and we call on you, uh, either Brianna or Bonnie will come around and give you a certificate. We have some really nice uh, t-shirts as a bonus to tell you that questioning matters. We've provided index cards on each of your chairs that you can use to formulate your questions or to take notes. Our Q&A will last for about 75 minutes, uh, and then Valentino will be signing books uh, afterwards. On your chairs, there are also short uh, survey forms at the end of tonight's program. They're really important in terms of continuing the funding of Memphis Reads, so please take the two minutes that it will take and, and fill out those uh, questionnaires and make sure that you uh, give them to someone who looks like they know what they're doing, which doesn't include me. Uh, finally, please uh, silence your phones and keep them in your pockets unless you are tweeting. Please tweet. You can follow that electronic conversation at hashtag what is the what Memphis? Capitalize all the letters of each word. That's hashtag what is the what Memphis. Last but not least piece of my introduction. For those of you who have read what is the what, you've already met Valentino Acek Deng. In 2006, Deng and Eggers at the same time as the publication of the book, established the Vod Foundation to help rebuild South Sudanese communities by increasing educational access. Mr. Deng has since served as the Minister of Education for Northern Bar, Bar al-Ghazal, overseeing more than 800 state-run schools in addition to the Vod Foundation's private secondary school. Mariel Bai Secondary School was created and is operated through the generosity of donors around the world. It has become a model for holistic education in the region by incorporating sustainable agriculture, vocational training, and gender equality into every aspect of the curriculum. There are information cards on the chairs distributed throughout. I just want to say that your motto when it comes to philanthropy ought to be give globally and act locally. Give globally and act locally. Be generous to the Vod Foundation if you can. Now, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Valentino Acek Deng. Good evening, everyone. I am happy and grateful to be here this evening and to share with you. I know it has been a long day. Uh, many of you are students. Many of you are professors. Many of you are businessmen and women. And to take out this evening schedule to come here means a lot. I know America, I have worked here, and after work, people are normally exhausted. <laughs> so I want to thank you deeply for uh, being a part of this gathering. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the professors at Rhodes 
and the sponsors to make sure uh, there is an event like this for the city and who also uh, selected the book for Memphis. Uh, it's not a story that usually people will pick up and read. But it's a story of humanity. And I am always uh, grateful that when someone picked up a copy of this book, they hardly lay it down, at least from the letters that I receive. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, I am not going to talk very long because I'm going to spend the next two days in the city discussing the book. Uh, Dave Eggers will join us tomorrow. And many of you will also come to the other events. So I would like to talk briefly and leave a time for uh, people who have read the book to ask questions. But I'm going to talk about uh, two main things. What I am doing currently and why I decided to pen my story. So let me start it the other way with why I committed to telling my story. In 1983, a civil war broke out in South Sudan that fitted the then government of Sudan that was based in Khartoum against many rebel groups in South Sudan. That conflict, which many thought would be fought between the rebels and the government, was extended to civilians. And by 1984, my village of Marialbay was attacked by regular government forces and burned to ashes. It was my first encounter with the violence. Years later, the government of Sudan had recruited and armed a militia in the present day Darfur and North Sudan and sent them to the south. Their aims was to destroy villages, to take livestock, to abduct young boys and girls and to kill the grown up when possible. I saw horrors that I should not have seen at my age. But there was no help. So by 1987, I had to leave Marialbay with thousands of other children across South Sudan. And I work for a distance of nearly 1,000 miles on barefoot, sleeping in the wilderness, crossing the most unforgiving, swampy, and reverent regions Africa has. And I ended up in the refugee camps in Western Ethiopia in 1987. Then I began my new life. I had to accept the fact that it was going to be very difficult to return to my village, to reunite with my parents, and I had to live with many of my friends. We had to make do with what the refugee camps presented to us, and in 1992, I had to leave Western Ethiopia and went to Kenya, beginning a new life in a new refugee camps in a new country. And Kenya's hospitality has been a very wonderful one to many South Sudanese up to date. We were taken to schools in the camp. I did my primary and secondary school in Kenya, and even a two years uh, college at Nyahururu, the professor will tell you, 
I am an alumni of National Outdoor Leadership Schools in Western Kenya. I studied environmental uh, conservation. I studied leaderships. I studied the people and the animal and the wilderness of Eastern Africa. I climbed Mount Kenya and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. The Maasai of Kenya call us Olololan, meaning people who are wandering, looking for trouble. Uh, so when it comes 2001, uh, the United States, especially the World Church Service, decided to bring thousands of young men from Sudan to America. And I did my resettlement process and came to New York on the 25th of September 2001. On the 26th, I was flown to Atlanta. That became my new home and had a blessing of being associated with the Jane Founder family. I would be visited by people like Angelina Julie, whom I did not know. Sometimes they are followed by a lot of media, and I would not understand why a young girl has to attract all of these cameras. I did not know so much about Hollywood and acting. And uh, it was then that I started thinking deeply about the war situation in my country. At that time, we had lost more than 2.5 million people in the war, and not so much advocacy was uh, made. And so we had to be ambassadors for our people. And I decided to be one such an ambassador. I would speak at churches, I would speak at social gathering, and at universities, high schools, talking about why, why is this war not being mitigated? It was then that I also decided to write a story of my life in a form of a book. And Mary Williams, a friend of mine, who is an adopted daughter of Jane Founder, introduced me to Deaf Agus. We met and began a new journey of writing a book and I remember very well nights when I can wake up and had to recall vivid memories and experience of war. And while I type them, sometimes I cry. Up to date, I hardly want to see anybody being mistreated. It just dropped me in tears. As a young boy, I lived through taking everything for granted. But as I grown up and being in America, I became so attached to humanity that I found it very difficult to witness mistreatment of other people. Comes, I, I actually, when I, I transferred to Allegheny College, and in 2006, uh, what is the word was published. I also went to the Clinton Global Initiatives at the same time and made a commitment to help educate the young minds in South Sudan. And you know when you made a commitment in front of Bill Clinton, you have to fulfill it because everybody knows it. <laughs> so I did that and we had also started the VAD Foundation and I went to Sudan to develop, finance, maintain, and operate the Marialbay Secondary School. It is now one of the best secondary schools in South Sudan. It's a home to 515 young girls and young boys, and they do very well. They have become part of my bigger family. I also reunited with my dad and mom, and I have a very big family. We are over 40 siblings. My dad is married 
to many wives. I am married to one and she will be the only one. <laughs> so uh, I am married and I have three children. So I have been traveling from 2007 back and forth, building schools in Sudan and coming back to fundraise and to make sure that we do not lost another generation of our children toward illiteracy. So that is what I have been doing. Uh, Memphis is not a new place for me. I used to come here sometime almost every month. I have uh, relatives here and some of them, you have seen them here. And uh, <laughs> even my cousin is married to a Memphis guy. So I used to come here and my favorite place was the Shelby Library uh, along the popular avenue. I've even seen this school here. <laughs> I've even seen uh, Rhodes School. Uh, possibly I might have even seen some of you in the restaurants or in the malls. So I have liked this city because I have a, a very strong connection with it. And I am honored that you have selected what is the what uh, to be the book that the city can read. Uh, I do not know how well to thank you. I wish you could speak my native language, Dinka. I could have told you a few words. But there is something I want to make a mention of. We have an elder here who is also a professor. Professor Boyd is, uh, was crowned a elder in one of our villages some years back, and he is actually considered a Dinka elder. Uh, if anything happened to those of us that he knows, he would be the first to be consulted. I did not know he was here. I just found him here, and I was like, why have you not told me you were here? <laughs> <laughs> and I was asking him, have you told the people that you have an association with us? But you know he is a lecturer and have to be reserved. So I'm very grateful to have him here. Uh, sitting next to him is our, my brother from Kenya, also a lecturer here. And I would, it tells me that maybe the book had been discussed extensively and I am going to leave this time for those of you who have questions to us uh, to have the opportunity. And I will be here for the next two days. And now, next time when I come back to Memphis, I would want to explore some of this new circle here. Thank you very much, and I will end here. that Mary Williams uh, would put you in touch with Dave Eggers to write your biography. Um, what made you decide that Mr. Eggers and the way that he wanted to write your story was correct for you and that it was the best choice? Um, did you think that what is the what, the final product, accurately represents what all that you went through? Uh, Mary Williams is a very good friend of mine. I had come to know him and we had worked together. Actually, at the times uh, he recommended Dave, there were four other writers, including university professors, who were interested in working with me. But I was being very careful about the materials I want to present to people and how it would be presented. Mary had read Dave's book, The Heartbreaking Work of a Staggering Genius, and she told me, this guy is also a lost boy like you, and he can understand you very well, and I believe both of you uh, would, uh, would make very good friends. And uh, so 
in December 2002, Dave called me and we spoke. And it was like uh, he was telling me, I am blessed to connect with you. And I'm saying, no, you are not the one blessed. I am the one blessed. And we arranged for him to visit in January. Uh, so Mary being a friend of mine and me also meeting Def before we started anything uh, worked out well for us to work as a team. Uh, when I was doing a research for the book, I actually took Def to my village in December 2003 with his younger brother, Tof, if you read the heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius, he had to take care of his younger brother, who was only eight years old. And we went to my village. There was nothing in Sudan at the time. We took a, uh, a UN cargo uh, flight that was so noisy. There were boxes and only the three of us and Russian pilots who even were smoking in the hair. And it got so loud, we had to take a, a tissue, a toilet tissue, and stuck it on our ears. So we went I had a test of them. And uh, that, was, uh, that is how I met this. I was introduced to him. I had not read his book. But again, I trust until someone proved me wrong. It has been my life. That's why I was even beaten in Atlanta. You know, I was mocked in my apartment because I trusted someone, let him in, and then they needed something different. The result was I was mocked and beaten and left unconscious. But up to date, if I meet that person, I will tell them, thank you that you did not take my life. But that was not a good thing to do. So that is how we met. Now, whether or not the book had presented the story in the way I want, I had come from a form of an art background. If you read the book, I was an actor. I had written and recited poems. I did cultural dance. I was leading uh, a group of youth that was 18,000 in numbers from eight different countries. So I know how stories can be told to an audience, or how audience can get a story. I wanted to write a purely biographical, biography, pure biography, but then you are presenting a story to an audience that does not know Sudan that would not otherwise not even uh, connect the dot of some of the historical events that have happened. And we decided to fictionalize it. It's not that the story is a fiction, but we take something from a different era and a different decade and join them to tell a story. And so it is not a story of one person, but it's also a true story. So I'm comfortable with that, and today, uh, to prove that, it's a book that people read and connect with, and we are sitting here because of that. So the book is presented well. Does that answer you? Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you've been through all that, that terrible things, and I was wondering if, if there are times that you have thought about maybe, not so much, like maybe revenge or retribution, if there should be. Uh, no. There is not a single time that I have thought about a revenge or a retribution. In fact, when I am upset about something, the first thing I do is not go to bed without praying and forgiving, even the fact that I was mad at somebody or at something. 
uh, it does not help me or anybody to think about revenge, to think about hurting anybody. Yes, we live and we think and we are many people and we have differences, but at times, what do we get when we think about revenge or doing something against anybody that is illegal? There is definitely nothing. And my life itself has been an example of someone who went to places he doesn't know, but because of human generosity, he had been received and given the opportunities to prevail. I grew up in Ethiopia, I grew up in Kenya, both are not my countries. I now speak some Ethiopian language, some Kenyan language, they are not my languages. I came to the US, I'm living with almost about everybody on earth, and it is a good thing to appreciate and not to think about revenge. That is why I went back to South Sudan to give back and to educate young people, to help them realize that there's a great benefit when we accept to live in a cross-cultural situation and live constructively and in peace. I hope I have answered you. Thank you. You were eventually able to come to America. Um, what do you think would have been different if that had been delayed, if you had had to stay in Sudan for longer than you would hope? And what are, in looking back, are there any situations that you would have, you would have, you would say that you wish you would have handled differently? I would not have liked anything that uh, devoid me of uh, aligning with the United States of America. You know, I'm a U.S. citizen, and uh, having had that privilege to come to America had given me a lot of chances to be able to make differences. Uh, and if I had not come here at the time, or if I was delayed, for example, my original flight was on September 11. I was actually stranded at the airport and in Nairobi for nearly two weeks before I came to the US. I hated that experience in every way possible. I watched TVs and watched news every day and I was fortunate enough to come here. There is something uh, in America that even most Americans take for granted. This is one of the best countries in the world. And Americans are very generous and passionate people. Yes, sometimes our governments and our politician hurts people, but the American as people are among the most generous people I have come to know. That is why this country has continued to attract millions of people to come here. Even those that their countries are doing well want to come here. So I would not have liked not coming here. This country has given me the opportunity to share my story what I can say millions now. It has given me the opportunity to uh, use my uh, talents, to realize and use my talents. It has given me the opportunity to go back to South Sudan and help open the eyes of thousands of people. It has also given many of my country, fellow country, men and women an opportunity to go to schools, to be engineers, to be doctors, to be PhD oldest. You know, the so-called Lost Boys community is among the most progressive immigrant groups United States have had. Members of that group are highly educated. 
and it is not long ago, it's less than maybe 15 years ago. So this is a very good connection. And that is something you get when you are in America. Be proud of being an American. I know you are a young man, but it's a very good country. Thank you. Any, have I answered you? Have I answered you? Oh, oh yes, sir, absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Another question? Yes, it's coming from these quarters now. Uh, my understanding of the causes of the civil war uh, that generated the exodus of uh, many people from South Sudan was the politics of marginalization, right? the politics of exclusion, oppression, and victimization. That is what caused the civil war in 1983. Now, with the independence of South Sudan in 2011, many were hopeful that everything would be very good in South Sudan. But apparently there is a problem there in terms of the fallout between the new political elite. Uh, what in, in your view is the problem and how can it be addressed? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, it's also a political question. <laughs> but I, I know that South Sudan had made a grave mistake by going back to a sense of violence that we rejected in the first place. The reason, among the reasons for the 1983 liberation wars was that the government of Sudan had denied South Sudanese participation in the economic, social, and political life of the country. And as a result, masses of people, educated and uneducated, took up armed and fought until the international community joined in. United States in particular played a major role in the realization of peace agreement an ending of war in 2005. Unfortunately, being a new government with leaders who also are human beings, the government of South Sudan uh, had ignored some of the main objectives that should have been executed to get the people back to a sense of complete normalcy. Among this was that there was a lack of grassroots reconciliation. There had, Sudan had used rivalry communities to fight one another. The liberation war had involved use of proxy militia groups to attack other communities and it should have been addressed by uh, reconciling the people so that no one goes back to their community and mobilize them against the government. A big mistake also is that the government became the main source of employment and wealth. And in many developing countries, that is one major cause of violence. Because a certain politician would go to mobilize his people to take down the government that they think is sitting on resources and jobs. And people will accept, especially the youth who are uneducated and have no jobs, to, to, to team up and topple the government. So in December 2013, uh, there was this incident when there was a fighting in the city and it was blamed on a coup. And as a result, the vice president uh, took to the bush and started a rebellion against the government. Uh, unfortunately, this 
uh, violence has fitted two major uh, ethnic groups against one another with members of the Nuer, majority of them supporting rebellions and majority of the Dinka people supporting the government. It is not a declared ethnic fighting. I am a Dinka and I see no reason for going to take somebody because it's just another person. There are also Nuer who will attest to you. But again, it is a work of the politicians. They can mislead people. And in a country where literacy level is so low and people are not aware of each other's existence existen in one space, people can be used very easily to fight wars that they only regret. That is what uh, caused the, the violence. It's the political leadership could not accommodate one another. And the issue escalated. It's actually one ruling party like you have the Republican and Democrat. So you have Democrat ruling and then they started a civil war among themselves, not even the Republican Party. So it's a senseless conflict. Good news is it is coming to an aim. Two days ago they signed the security arrangement, agreement, and on uh, November 15th, members of the rebel delegation will head back to Juba. It is expected that the former vice president will return to Juba in December and they will have a three-year interim government period where they will adjust the constitution, they will adjust the leadership and the structure of the government and after that people can go back to elections and we hope uh, this incident will not repeat itself again. Thank you. Valentino, let me pick up on one of the comments you made earlier about the um, progressive nature of the so-called lost boys. Um, I'm astonished, frankly, as I look at what you and your, your confreres have accomplished um, since coming to this country. And, and your ability to turn something horrendous into something good. Um, it strikes me that you guys, you guys came here, uh, you were in the camps in Kenya, in Ethiopia and Kenya, and you didn't just sit, you got an education. And when you came here, you got more education. Once you, once you began to kind of settle into U.S. culture um, and, and adapt, you, you got more education. But you never forgot the people at home. You never forgot the people in the villages. You never forgot the people in South Sudan. And you turned into remarkable social entrepreneurs. I mean, you're one of the more successful ones, but you know, John Dow has a John Dow Foundation. Gabriel Bolding has, a, has his foundation building a school in Ariang. Uh, Lopez Lamong, who was, uh, you may, I don't know whether any of the audience remember, but he carried the American flag at the, the Beijing Olympics. Um, he was a, a lost boy who has his own foundation. Do you think that now is the time for lost boys, the so-called lost boys, now that you're in your 30s and many of you are married and have children, to go back and take an active part in South Sudanese political life? Um, you were in, in northern Barra Guzal as an education minister for a while. Bo Ding is now in the government's office in the, um, um, in, in, in the president's office in a finance position. Uh, I noticed in the paper today that a young man from Virginia uh, was just sworn in as a foreign service officer in the State mm -hmm. Department. And of course, in typical State Department fashion, they assigned this South Sudanese to Venezuela. But that's a, <laughs> that's a whole other whole question. <laughs> Is it likely that more and more people will go back and at least split time between here and there? Because you do have feet in both worlds. Uh, yes, it is uh, likely many uh, uh, members among the South Sudanese diaspora, let me not only talk about the lost boys, uh, will go back uh, to work in South Sudan. They are a very uh, uh, fundamental, I mean very uh, 
uh, strategical groups of South Sudanese that are expected to return to help in the building of the country. Uh, if you follow up or you get to know more, there are incidences where people are appointed to go and serve in the government without even being consulted. That is how I became a state minister for education. <laughs> I was in New York uh, attending the Clinton Global Initiative, the UN meetings, and the next thing I heard in the news is that I am a state minister for education. And you cannot say no when that happened, because <coughs> people have heard it. Uh, so, and there are many uh, among the South Sudanese diaspora who have gone back. There are folks who are ministers. There are folks who are city mayors. There are folks who are doing engineering work building roads, building airport, folks who are in the law enforcement, and you name it. Uh, the mistake the South Sudanese diaspora would do is not to return to the country when we know very well that the leadership of that country is being made in exile. When someone get an opportunity to attend roads, He's not just a normal student, he's a future leader of something in South Sudan. And that is how you should see them. When you see them on the, str on the street, they are expected. There are few uh, among them, like me, who would be privileged to get some finances, some connection, and would go home to, to work. It doesn't mean the others do not want to go. It just depends on what opportunity someone has. Also in America, we have people who are serving in the U.S. Marine, in the U.S. Navy, in the U.S. Uh, uh, National Guards, and even people that are in the police service. They are out there, people are, who are lecturers at the universities. And it's also a contribution to the United States. If America is a melting pot, this is also one example that there are South Sudanese Americans and one day South Sudan will be led by a South Sudanese American. It is possible. It's actually very possible. Maybe even in the next decades you will hear it. So we are very much, we are well regarded back at home, just as we are supported here, and it is a good thing. Unfortunately, I'm from the English department, <laughs> so I'm going to turn the tables a little bit. Uh, you talked about this briefly at the beginning, but I want to press you a little bit more on the novel's interesting status as the autobiography of Valentino Acek Deng and a novel by Dave Eggers. Uh, the English professor in me says that it can't be both. It needs to be one or the other, uh, but it is both. So I wanted to see how you would advise us to read this book uh, as a novel by Dave Eggers and your autobiography. And since you touched upon it briefly, I <clears throat> also had a second question regarding the structure. Throughout the entire novel, um, your life story is interspersed uh, within a narrative of a single 24-hour period in Atlanta. Uh, the robbery, the mugging, and your trip to the hospital. And I wanted to know if you and Dave talked about why you structured it that way and how that is supposed to operate on the reader. So. The book is actually both and also one of the other. That's <laughs> uh, a true story. I have lived it and we decided to call it a biographical novel because there are some historical events that didn't necessarily happen to me and that were important to present as well. I mentioned in the beginning that I actually was 
reaching out to the world. I was speaking to the audience. I was speak like when when you look at the scenes where I am in the gym and swiping cards and you're coming, I'm there at 5 a.m. I have a lot of things I'm thinking about. But I know also I'm serving you as a client. And I would be talking to myself. Do you even know this? Like the guys who mocked me. I'm like, did you even know how I came here? Maybe you saw me driving a new Toyota Corolla and you think that is really a valuable thing. <laughs> and you might have thought I am a son of some rich president who have come here to study. Come on, I am not. So the book is an historical account of my life, but I had to to also include things that happened in the country that necessarily didn't happen to me for the sake of telling the story. Normally it would just be a, a memo. We could have ignored that and call it a memo. So take it for two. It is a, it is a novel and it is a biographical novel. Before, before we turn the mics over to the audience, I just want to make sure that we respond to the second uh, question. It's me, Valentino. I'm over here. Okay. Um, the question about the form of the novel and the way in which it takes place within a 24-hour period. Um, would you mind just responding to that? And then I'll just say, if you're interested in asking a question, if you would just raise your hand and then Either uh, Brianna or Bonnie will bring over the mic and, um, and we'll proceed that way henceforth. You know, if uh, the, the format, the book is presented as brought everything into, uh, let me say just a book format people are going to read it and they will not, it is not, diff, it is not easy to present something in 1983 and use the historical account and even timeline and then come to 2004 or 2003 when I'm in America and you do the same things in one book. Uh, it just was very challenging. By the way, at a certain point, I got tired. <laughs> I, I just thought I was just going through so much. And why not tell just a part of it? And it has to be presented to people in a way that is a structure. Even if you were to know some of the event, we do not mention the timeline. Because it will be very difficult for a reader to take that on. So when you read it in 24 hours, we just meant it something is a complete story. But you can take it apart into 20 other books if you were to investigate every incident in there. There are many other books written about South Sudan and they tackle these things in that scenario. But for what is the what we decided to, it's like you're writing a script about a movie. You know, if you have seen the good lie, the first 15 minutes of the movie would have happened in my village, not anywhere, right? But you move in and the other things happen elsewhere. It does not make it a true story. It's still a true story, but it was concise and combined. Someday you will have uh, my biography. There's a lot that I have done. The book only tells you about me 20 years ago and a bit about the incidents in Atlanta. You will even read in the book that I'm struggling with life in America, right? 
No, I am not. I'm one of the most successful members of the group. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about your first encounters with American culture. Uh, now that you've seen success with the book and have traveled throughout the US, has your perception of America changed in any way from your initial arrival? Did you ask that question again? Yeah, sorry. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about your first encounters with American culture. And now that you've seen success and have traveled around the US, have your perceptions of America changed since your initial arrival? Uh, I have had a very positive perception of America. Let me put that aside. But again, it's a new society. And when I came to Atlanta, you know, sometime I'm riding a bus from Kensington to downtown Atlanta, if you know. And there are a lot of people who speak English but with a very heavy southern accent. <laughs> and you say, ha, ah, what is this? <laughs> I'm supposed to hear everyone here, and you don't. And then at times, you know, I forget what my station was, and you end up going further. I even remember I, my first job was at a Best Buy store. And I befriended the manager only for the purpose of playing with a lot of music. Uh, it was the days of people like Usher in town and, and Mary J. Blige, all of this music. I'm just playing different type of music. I don't know that there is a certain uh, music that you must play at work. <laughs> and it was fun. I remember I had a friend who had a Christmas gift shop and I, I worked there during the holiday and my work was to wrap Christmas gift and sometime there is this Santa Claus, you know it's still there and when you're told a story of Santa Claus and you for the first time you think he does exist <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't. And then I say, but, but why only in America? <laughs> so those are funny things. One Christmas I dressed like a black Santa Claus, and it is also fun. So it just there was so much, that there was so much to learn. And I am a person who must know something to be comfortable with it. And also the walking scenario that you have to look for a job and I came I was, when I came I was 22 years old and I was worried am I going to be homeless am I going to to manage paying for my school and all of that those were the challenges and I also didn't know that I actually had severe allergies and the southern part of United States has the worst pollen I have known. <laughs> and a lot of time I would be sneezing with running eyes, with headache, and I did not know. You know, when I came to know that you can go to World Green and buy, you know, Zyrtec or uh, all of those uh, allergy medicine, I was like, God. I almost gave up on life here just because of this. <laughs> so if you don't know those things eh, and you are in a new country, it makes it very challenging. And that is what we have presented in the book. And when people read it, they think, oh, how about his headache? He's not doing well. He would not like being here. No. Even when I was mocked in Atlanta, the way I take it, is that in a big metropolitan area, things happen. And I was not exceptional. I let in somebody I did not know, just like anybody does. You could have been born in America and you can be marked. So why would I be exceptional? 
The next thing I thought is to accept the happening and be very careful not to trust very easily next time. So, uh, yes, my perceptions have improved <laughs> and I'm still learning. Another question? There's um, a, a gentleman here. You talked about starting over three different times with three completely different cultures. Um, uh, speak up. Okay. You talk in your book about starting over three different times in completely different cultures. What role do these cultures play in your household today and how um, and shaped your role as a father for your kids? You know, it's very good to live in a cross-cultural environment. And also the most important thing there is to have positive attitude to new uh, things that uh, are presented to you. I am a very uh, informed father and a husband and a community member. And it is because of the interactions I have had with different kind of people. They have strengthened my faith in humanity. They have strengthened the way I approach issues. Uh, it has strengthened then how I looked even into our world community and the challenges facing us. And I always tell people that we have so much in common that we are able to comprehend sometime. All that we need is to look into what we have around us and what we have on the planet. We all have challenges. They come in different shapes and forms. And we all have success stories. They come in different forms. But we are just one people, human beings. And that is how I looked at the way I interact with the different cultures, different people. I even imagine how in the world I sat on the plane and I knew I was, go I was going to fly for over 21 hours, crossing the oceans, the desert, nations, coming to America where I had no single friends. But because I had a positive attitude and that people live there and I will live with them, I am now a proud American and a member of the global community who just goes anywhere and stay there. I hope I have answered you. Thank you. Um, first, let me start by saying I'm humbled by your presence. May, um, may you speak up? I, so I just wanted to start by saying that I'm humbled by your presence this evening. But my question is, um, having gone through a myriad of, for instances, that proved to be life-threatening, um, what has become of your relationship to death? My, my relationship to death? Yeah, having, having been in um, so many, for instances, that could have proven to be life-threatening in the moment and in hindsight, how has that sort of shaped your perception of death? Or do you no longer fear death? And I just wanted to sort of understand how you conceptualize, you know, your runnings. Mm, that's a, a good question. Uh, you know, we all fear death. <laughs> And, and we also accept it. Sometimes you never know how it will come. Uh, and everybody want to live for long. You want to live to be 80, 90, or even 100 years old. So I have uh, not thought about death in a personalized way, but when I felt threatened, it was the time I was in Sudan, and I was young, and it was war, and it was not particularly about me. It's just about the people and the region, and I was not uh, a target as a person. And I managed to get out of that, that I was also uh, uh, a young 
I, 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 that I was a young boy, you know, I took a lot of things for granted. There are days, you know, you are facing famine, you are facing uh, diseases, you are facing uh, what may lead to your extinction. But being uh, young, being a young boy, sometimes you take those things for granted. If you are scared about being bitten by a snake or, or drowning or mosquitoes at night and it is wet, then you wait for the daylight. Then when it comes, I am playing. I'm going to the bush looking for fruits of trees to eat and we even make a soccer out of sock and kick it. And that was the order of life then. When it changed and you are in the refugee camp, my next priority is to wake up and go to school. I did not have the light to read. But you wake up on daylight, you do everything, you go to sleep. When I came to the U.S., my, uh, my priorities also changed. But uh, I do not have any relationship with death. <laughs> I have never thought about it, but that is a very good question. Uh, uh, and I am very concerned about uh, things that happen to us as human beings. And I want to see everybody happy every day in my life. And that is what I look for. That is my dream. I never think about death. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. And I would, you talked in your opening statements about how you were somewhat surprised uh, first coming here at how little was being done to help uh, the with the troubles you experience in South Sudan. Um, and it's definitely a personal opinion of mine that at least in this country, our educational system is more focused on uh, teaching kids uh, what they can do rather than what they should be doing, uh, as evidenced by like the standardized testing systems we've implemented. Um, so I was wondering, with your experiences, uh, both as a student uh, and an educator in refugee camps, as well as a minister of education here, I suppose, um, what what we can do to shift public opinion such that we view it worthwhile to get an education in which you read books like Edgar's What is the What, um, in which students learn how to write such moving novels, and perhaps most importantly, to give students the ability to act on the impetus that they get to, felt, to help their fellow humankind, even though they be halfway around the world. Thank you. I, I am a proponent of education. One of my uh, themes of, of advocacy is that I advocate for the universal rights to education and I do this at global forums. Uh, an education that prepare a young person to have a skill to be able to transform their community or societies is the best education. And I think many young people should not give up on learning or on acquiring that kind of education. Sometimes we take uh, education for granted Maybe you have a family that can afford to send you to school and you know they have a business so you will not run out of jobs. But learn, there is nothing wonderful than the desire to learn and learn and learn. If you have nothing to learn about Memphis, learn something about Nashville. <laughs> if you have nothing to learn about the United States, learn something about UK and Africa and all of that and you will find that no sort of landing goes without a benefit. It is the same reason I went back and established a school in a very remote area and you would be surprised to see children 
sitting sometime, 50 of them, around one light bulb to learn. And we even went on and decided that we were going to expose them to scientific experience, to technical education, when they are still in high school. And we now have children, we have high school students who can manufacture a body jelly or lotion, who can make bathing soaps, who can make candles, who can make uh, a different kind of things. And we have a school garden and a school farm. So that is a transformational kind of learning. But knowledge is good. I cannot talk about the U.S. education system because it's one of the best education system there is. It depends on how you take it. But if you were to be taken to another country, deprived of that education and brought back here, you will understand what it is. But in my country, we need more education, even to be able to sustain a peaceful environment, to be able to educate, to educate people to know how to live with one another in a peaceful environment. Uh, I don't know if I am answering you correctly, but learning in any form is good. I would first like to thank you for being here and sharing your story. Um, in chapter six, you mentioned, um, Dave Eggers mentioned the what is the what title. Um, could you just explain the significance of that title and how you and Dave Eggers came to that to be the title of the book? That title is everything. <laughs> <laughs> there is not one way I put it personally. But if you look at some of the literature around the book, people try to put it to one thing. Uh, it also will go back to how the book is a novel or not a novel, to the historical event happening in the book, like the loss of 2.5 million people when the world did not know a lot about it. You know, you look at what is the what? Over 2.5 million South Sudanese have died. But at the same time, we're talking about 800,000 Rwandese who died in 1994. One thing has become a global focus, another is not. But it's all about human beings. And you cannot say what happened in Rwanda is acceptable, you know. But it's how things happen. So if I were to explain to you what, what is the what is, there is a lot into it. So there's no single answer that I can give you. It is that story you have read in the book. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. And secondly, I wanted to ask you, um, during your lifetime you've seen a lot of emotions, a lot of dark emotions such as fear and pain, and yet you present yourself before us as someone both humble and happy. I would like to ask you, how do you manage to be such a good person and such an optimistic person, considering all of the hardship you've had to go through? And what advice would you give us, young people, so we can aspire to be somewhat more like you? A very good question. It's very difficult to see somebody who have gone through a lot coming out positively. But that is the mistake we make. That is why even sometimes a society give up on young people without pro helping them to realize their potential talents and be productive members of the society. If you read the book and you think so much have happened to me, that I should give up in life and not do well, uh, you are wrong. <laughs> the event that I have seen in the book have actually strengthened me. And that is why they are written for you to have and share. 
First of all, even if there was no war in South Sudan, there was going to be a movement in my community when I would be sent into a cattle camp as a young boy, and I had to live there with a growing up and learn the way of livestock and of cow and grow. It's hardship if you compare it to what a child should be allowed to do in America. I would have to take cows into the pasture. I would have to stay up awake at night. And it's still part of growing up. It is normal in one setting and difficult in another setting. If you go to some countries now, kids are sent to boarding school when they still have not completed their primary school. And no child in the U.S. would be allowed to go to a boarding school at that age, right? But it's normal. In one setting, it is not something that is encouraged in another setting. I grew up without my parents, but there were community members there. There were elders there. And in my community, a prison of a elder is a very strong thing to young people. You know, when I told you that uh, Professor Boyd, or we call him Majangdit, you know, he has a cow name like any other elder. If I, am, if I live here and I know he is ordained a, a elder, I expect to get what he's telling me and do it. So we had elders with us. We were actually taught the history of our country and why we were suffering and that we must be strong to live to fight another war if the war the adults were fighting was not successful. So those experiences have strengthened me. There are many people who did not make it at my age who had remained in the country, but I was not. The book tells you about my life when I was in the Sudan, and that was an experience of maybe two years combined together. I escaped, I lived in refugee camps in, in Ethiopia, and I was fine. I lived in the refugee camps in Kenya. I even went to a Kenyan uh, schools, not a refugee schools. I was in a boarding school and in primary school, you know, uh, Molo Secondary School, I went there. It's a very fertile, very nice place. So it is expected for a young man to resist in Sudan. We make warriors, our people go through head scarification where they put a knife in and pull it. I did not go through those. I think of those ones as being more difficult than the life I have lived. <laughs> yeah. I just received the book today, so I have not read it, but I will. But my question to you is, what was your strongest motivation to keep moving forward and to not give up in the middle of your difficult journey? I am a leader. <laughs> I have a lot of people who are depending on the choices I make, on the decisions I make, on the life I live. That is a very strong motivation. From the life I have lived, I have become a person others look up to for encouragement, for support, and moral support. So that is a strong motivation. I have also been able to live from one country to another, doing good things. I have not told people, but one thing I'm working on now, one thing I'm looking at in Africa, is developing African economies by looking at the basic infrastructure development that will transform the market, the agriculture, and all of sort that are needed. Because Africa has the potential to grow. And when you hear about those things, I'm working for Blackstone in Africa. 
So there is a lost boy you see here, but in Africa, I'm a different kind of person. Those are motivations. That is the time that we have for tonight, but as I said when I opened, um, the style this dialogue is going to continue. Uh, <laughs> I suppose if you hold two mics, you might just uh, hit the mute button. It's going to continue tomorrow night, uh, where Dave Eggers and Valentino will be speaking together. Um, it'll be followed by a book signing. That will happen at uh, the Creative Arts Building at 2375 Tiger Lane. Uh, at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. I want to encourage everyone to uh, come there. We have uh, bookmarks that have the address just in case that you don't know it. Uh, before we leave tonight, of course, I want to thank Valentino and all of the questioners, including uh, all of you tonight, for what was a wonderfully a rich conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much.